Some Christians believe that the Bible is the primary, supreme, and only source of revelation, that if something is not explicitly mentioned in its pages, it cannot be held as divinely instituted. Catholics, of course, do not accept this doctrine. We know that Jesus exists as the head of the living and growing church, sent his Holy Spirit to guide the church on earth through the centuries, and that the church existed as a worshiping, faithful community well before the canon of scripture was codified. But despite the popular misconception, this does not mean that the Bible is somehow secondary or insignificant to us, or that our doctrines are entirely made up. Everything we believe, truly, finds justification in scripture, even if it took years to fully develop into the practice we have today. What are some disputed Catholic doctrines and where can we find them in the Bible? This is Catholicism in Focus. A key feature to the Roman Catholic priesthood is the near universal requirement of clerical celibacy. Except for a few very rare cases, you can either be married or a priest but not both. This is a problem for some Protestants who look to 1 Timothy 4 and see some leaders being called hypocrites and liars for forbidding marriage. Anyone should be able to marry, they say, and celibacy is completely unbiblical. Catholics, of course, remember what Jesus said about unmarried people in the Gospel of Matthew. Some are incapable of marriage because they were born so, some because they were made so by others, some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can accept this ought to accept it. The Catholic Church does not forbid marriage. Our canon law actually treats it as a natural right. What we teach is precisely what Jesus said and did. Some people are given the gift of celibacy, choosing to live unmarried for the sake of the kingdom. This is what Jesus did, it's what the disciples did after they met Jesus, and it's been a sign of ministerial leadership since the beginning. And what does that ministerial leadership do? it offers the sacrifice. But priests do not re-sacrifice Christ over and over. This is a common misconception of the word sacrifice. In the Old Testament law, we see that the priests had two duties in presenting offerings to God, killing the animal and offering the sacrifice. While they're often treated as one single act, they are in fact distinct, as in the case of a cereal offering. No death takes place to offer this sacrifice. As it stated in the letter to the Hebrews, Christ died once for all, and so what Catholics celebrate is not the re-killing of Christ, but the eternal banquet feast of the Lamb. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is presented as simultaneously priest offering the sacrifice, the slain lamb to be sacrificed, and the altar on which the sacrifice is offered. We do not mimic or repeat this feast, but take part in the single eternal banquet. Of course, the sacrifice on the altar is not simply a sign or symbol of Christ, but constitutes the real sacramental presence of Christ's body and blood. Besides being the unquestioned stance of the church until the 11th century, we can look to John 6 for justification. It's a long passage, so I encourage you to read the whole chapter yourself, but after feeding 5,000 people, Jesus tells the people multiple times, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. For some, this is just metaphorical language. And on the surface, it may be. But not when you look closer. At two other times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says something that people mistake for literal language, and so he clarifies. He tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. Nicodemus protests, and he clarifies. You must be born of water and spirit. He tells the woman at the well that he has living waters. She asks for a drink, and he clarifies he will quench a spiritual thirst. But in John 6, this clarification never comes. He says, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world, that people question the literal meaning, and Jesus merely doubles down. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. No clarification, no metaphorical meaning. What's more, the Greek word that he uses for eat is not the common one designating sustenance, it's the one translated gnaw or chew, a literal, visceral image. Sticking with the sacraments, Catholics are encouraged, even compelled at times, to confess their sins to a priest. Priests have this ability because of John 20, in which Jesus breathes into the disciples, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Christian faithful, then, are encouraged to exercise this gift in the letter of St. James, as the Apostle writes, 
Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of the righteous person is very powerful. So yeah, despite being controversial for some, it's pretty cut and dry. The Bible explicitly says it. While all sin is to be avoided, this does not mean that all sin is to be treated the same. Catholics distinguish between venial and mortal sins, just as 1 John distinguishes between deadly and not deadly sins. If anyone sees his brother sinning, if the sin is not deadly, he should pray to God and he will give him life. This is only for those whose sin is not deadly. There is such a thing as deadly sin, about which I do not say that you should pray. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not deadly. To be a part of the church community, one must be baptized, a sacrament that Catholics will celebrate for adults who have an explicit faith in Christ, but even with children that have yet to reach the age of reason. We see justification for this in principle in the many ways that Jesus gives grace to children or unbelievers upon the request of a faithful parent, as in the case of the healing of Jairus' daughter, the boy with a demon, and the centurion's slave, but also quite explicitly, as in the baptism of entire families. In Acts 16, we find two instances in which one person seeks to be baptized, and so the whole household is baptized. Paul and Silas say, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household will be saved. The faith of one saves the whole family, preparing each member for baptism. This line of thinking is particularly helpful in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, as it's often the case that the one being anointed is unable to ask for the grace of the sacrament themselves. Regardless, the letter of St. James makes clear that it is a sacrament that all Christians should seek. In chapter 5 of his letter, he writes, Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church, and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Praying on behalf of others is certainly a major part of the communal life of the Catholic Church, and it doesn't stop with just friends or family members. As believers in the resurrection, we seek the intercession of Mary and the saints in heaven to pray for us to God as well. But Christ is the only intercessor, some will say. Yes, in a substantive sense, he's the only one that actually intercedes the fullness and image of God, but that doesn't mean that we can't seek guidance and direction, even among the faithful departed. We know from Matthew 27 that those saints who have died have been resurrected and live in the kingdom of heaven. The passage states, The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Side note, this also gives justification for visions of Mary and the other saints, as it clearly says that the resurrected saints appeared to many. These saints in heaven can hear our prayers, as is evident in the rich man speaking to Abraham in Luke 16, and we know that these prayers are brought to God. In Revelation 5, the elders bring the prayers of the faithful in the form of incense to the altar. In Revelation 8, these prayers of earth are brought to the altar by an angel. If those who have died are not yet in heaven, we here on earth can still pray for them, just as Judas did in offering an expiatory sacrifice. Second Maccabees recounts, In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection in mind. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead, that they might be absolved from their sin. Of course, chief among the non-divine recipients of our prayers in heaven is Mary, the mother of God, which is why many Catholics pray the rosary. Admittedly, this devotion is not explicitly written in scripture as it was developed in the 13th century, but its main prayer, the Hail Mary, is straight from the Gospel of Luke. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The words of the angel Gabriel. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Elizabeth's words to Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. A final petition that simply asks Mary to pray for us, something we've already shown to be in keeping with Scripture. Finally, to have a little fun with this exercise, why don't we turn the tables a bit? While Catholics are often criticized for teachings that are clearly in the Bible, I want to point out a Protestant doctrine that is not. Sola Fide. 
Translated faith alone, it is the doctrine developed by Martin Luther that suggests that justification in Christ is by faith alone. It's a complicated matter for sure, which is why I did an entire video showing that most Protestants actually have a fairly moderate interpretation of the doctrine, largely in line with ours. But there are some other Christians who take the doctrine at face value and to the extreme, believing that it is literally faith and nothing more that matters for salvation. To that, I have a few passages to point out. James 2.14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? James 2.26, Faith without works is dead. 1 Corinthians 13.2, If I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Mark 10, Rich young man, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Matthew 25.45, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So, yeah, faith alone as simply having a belief in God but no action reminiscent of the kingdom doesn't appear in Scripture. No one can earn their salvation, but Jesus makes it pretty clear. Unless you care for the poor, show love to your enemies, follow after me, you won't be saved. So, what's the lesson in all this? I guess, read your Bibles, because it'll make you more Catholic. For whatever reason, Catholics just don't read their Bibles as much as other Christians do. Our church as a whole has a tremendous understanding of it. Our doctrines are deeply rooted in what it says. But many of what we would consider the average Catholic simply don't know this. And so, misconceptions are spread, confusion abounds, and people are left to think that Catholics don't care about the Bible. Our doctrine proves them wrong, but our people might prove them right. This is something we need to work on.